Hello, my name is Jack Ross and welcome to my science lab. Before you do any experiments or observations with a microscope, you should first be able to know how to properly use it and be able to name its parts. In this short 15 minute program, we're going to do just that and I'm going to show you three different ways to make microscope slides. Now many of you may already have done experiments and observations with a low power or stereo microscope. These are great instruments for low power observations. If we want to see something very tiny though, like a paramecium, we need to have more power. So in this program, we'll move up to the high power instrument. Let's take a look at these two that I have here. And let's use a slide called an onion root tip because it's got tiny little things to see. Let's start by putting it on the toy microscope and see what type of an image we get. I'll put it on the stage, make sure the light is on and shining on the slide, and try and focus on these onion root tip cells. I can see the outline of the cell, but I can't quite make out what those little black dots are inside the cell. Well, let's now take this same slide and use it on our student scope and see what type of image we get. Oh, here the image is much clearer, and we can see the nuclei inside these onion cells. We really just did our first experiment here. We compared two microscopes using the same slide. And if you want to try your microscope out, use the onion root tip slide and see what type of an image you get. I think you'll find that the better microscope produces a better image. You don't need 1,000 power. 400 power is quite enough but you do need good optics. And if you get a microscope like this, it should last you for many, many years. Now, although there's many different types of microscopes, they all have a lot in common. Let's take a look at the parts of a microscope and see how to properly use it. The lens on top is called the eyepiece lens because that's the lens you look into. And you should keep both eyes open when looking into a microscope. This will help reduce eye strain. If you have difficulty doing this at first, try putting a piece of black paper in front of your other eye. You may see a black line in your eyepiece lens. This is a pointer, and you can make it rotate around when you turn the lens. Below the eyepiece lens, we have the objective lenses. These are called the objective lenses because they're the lenses closest to the object. This microscope has three objective lenses and you choose the lens you want by turning the revolving nose piece and clicking the desired lens into position. To calculate the magnification, you multiply the power of the eyepiece lens by the power of the objective lens. This microscope has an eyepiece lens of 10 times and three objective lenses of 4, 10, and 40. I'll do the first one for you. 10 times 4 would be 40 power. And you do the other two for me. Remember, we have a 10 power eyepiece and a 10 power objective, and a 10 power eyepiece and a 40 power objective. You should be able to do that in your head. The slide is placed on the stage and held in place by stage clips. Some microscopes have a mechanical stage. This allows you to move the slide around mechanically by turning two knobs. It's especially useful to have a mechanical stage when you're tracking fast-moving objects, like protozoans. Under the stage is a light source or mirror. Some microscopes have condenser lenses to focus the light onto the stage. And some use a revolving wheel with different size holes. This wheel is called a diaphragm, and you pick the setting that gives you the best image. Usually, when working with the higher power lenses, you'll use a smaller opening on the diaphragm. The bottom of the microscope is called the base, and the arm connects the base to the lenses. 
Whenever you move a microscope, hold it carefully in both hands and support it by the base and the arm. Some microscopes have two focusing knobs, a coarse and a fine focusing adjustment. To properly focus a microscope, you look from the side and move the objective lens close to the specimen. Then looking in the eyepiece lens, you focus the lens upward or away from the specimen. You can probably understand why this is a very important procedure. Now usually when you use your microscope first, you start with the lowest power lens and move up in power. A quality microscope will have par focal objective lenses. This means that after you focus on the specimen, you can change to a new objective lens and still be in focus or be close enough to only need minor adjustment. Remember that when you switch to a higher power lens, only the center part of the image is going to be in the field of view. So make sure the part you want to see is in the center of your field of view before you move to the higher power lens. Finally, remember that dust is the microscope's number one enemy and always keep your microscope covered when not in use. Microscope slides can be prepared in three different ways the depression or well slide, the wet mount slide, and the permanent slide. The depression or well slide has an indentation where we place a drop or two of our sample. Since there's nothing covering the drop, you must be very careful not to adjust the objective lens down into the drop. In fact, because of this, you cannot use the high power objective lenses with a well slide. Remember, the proper way to focus is to lower the lens until it locks or almost touches the specimen, then focus upward only. Although well slides are easy to prepare and good for large organisms, there is a drawback. If the specimens move up or down within the drop, you'll find it difficult to keep them in focus. Here's a side view of a water drop. See the paramecium swimming up and down within the drop? One way to fix this problem is to flatten the water drop out with a regular slide and a cover slip or cover glass. A cover slip is a small square plate of plastic or very thin glass, and it's placed over the water drop and carefully lowered at an angle. With this preparation, which we call a wet mount slide, you can use your high power objective lens and focus very close to the specimen without damaging the lens. And because you're squeezing the water drop down into a thin film, you'll find it much easier to keep your specimen in focus. If you're looking at large specimens, you might add tiny bits of broken cover slip to the drop as spacers to keep them from getting squished. And if you want to make your drop last longer, carefully rub petroleum jelly onto each edge of the cover slip. The jelly seal will prevent evaporation and your specimen may last for up to several days. Now let's make our first wet mount slide of some small print cut from the classified section of a newspaper. Place the specimen on a flat slide and with your dropper add one to two drops of water. Now carefully lower the cover slip and place the slide on the stage. Use your lowest power objective lens first and focus on the newsprint. Look at the word you have on the slide. Now, look at the magnified image. Notice how it's different. The image is upside down. And what will happen to the image when you move the slide around? Try moving the slide left, then right, and remember which way the image moves. Practice this because later on we'll be following moving specimens and you'll have to be good at these opposite moves. The third and final type of slide preparation is called the permanent slide. And it's made much like the wet mount slide, except that we use a special cement or balsam instead of water. Now, if you have a thick specimen like this spider leg, you should probably use a spacer between the slide and the cover slip. Commercial spacers are available, as you see in this example. Or you could make your own out of construction paper. This square is cut to the size of the cover slip. It's then cemented onto the slide. You then place the specimen in the center and carefully add the proper amount of slide cement. Now, lower the cover slip over it at an angle and lightly press on the cover slip to spread out the cement. 
With just the right amount, you'll see a tiny bit seeping from the edges of the cover slip. Now you must allow the cement to dry, and this takes time. Allow at least five days. And don't forget to label your slide. On the label, you should identify what it is, record the date, and number it. Then in a separate notebook, list any extra information that might be important, like what type of spider the leg came from or where you found the spider. Now when professionals make slides, they usually prepare the specimen first by soaking it in special chemicals that fix or preserve the cells. Then on to other chemicals that dehydrate the cells. These solutions will remove the water from the cells and replace it with alcohol. Finally, the professional slide maker might use a clearing agent. This makes the specimen more transparent and easier to see under the microscope. There are books that explain how to perform these techniques, but for me, I usually go the easy way and hope that my slides will look okay and last for a while. Here's one of the first slides I ever made about 20 years ago when I was a kid and it's a specimen of a spider leg. I recently looked at it with a microscope, and it looks just as good today as it did in those days. We've learned a lot of things so far, how to use the microscope and a number of ways to make slides. Let's now take these skills and do some interesting observations with our microscope. We'll start by taking a look at cells. In this section, we're going to be investigating cells, and we have about five experiments to do here, and I have a couple of assistants with me. I have Dennis and Lisa, and the first experiment we're going to do is investigate onion skin cells, and these are plant cells. And to do this, Lisa has volunteered to try and peel off a thin piece of skin from this onion. So go ahead, Lisa, why don't you do that for us? There you go, you got a good piece there. Okay, now we've got a piece of onion skin. Now, why don't you, uh, Dennis, why don't you take a slide and cut a little piece of that off and put it on the slide for us here. Okay, yeah, go ahead and put that piece of onion skin on the slide. And I'm gonna add a couple drops of iodine here. And then Lisa, I want you to put the cover slip on it for me. Good. Okay, now Dennis, why don't you take that slide and let's check it out under the microscope. And we'll start at the lowest power. So put it on the stage. We'll start at the, uh, with the 4X objective. Go ahead and focus it and uh, tell me what you see there. I see a bunch of lines. Can you see any cells yet? Yeah. Okay, I'm gonna switch you up to the 100 power objective here. And let's see what we got now. Okay, go ahead and focus that in. Yeah. Move the, some move the slide around till you um, make sure you're looking at the onion skin there. You can see it now? Yeah. Okay. Now let's go up to 400 power. And this is real critical focusing, so be real careful here. Okay, what do you see now? I see about six cells. Okay, and can you see the nuclei? Yeah. Did the iodine kind of bring it out so we can see it better there? Yeah. Okay, uh, Lisa, you want to take a look, don't you? Okay, Lisa, what do you see? I see a bunch of yellow dots. Yellow dots? Those are the nuclei in the cell. Can you see the wall of the cell there? Yes. And what shape are these onion skin cells? Like rectangular lines. Okay, so that's our plant cell. And now for our next experiment, we're going to take a look at animal cells. And to do that, I need a volunteer here to scrape the inside of his or her cheek. Which one of you guys wants to do that? I will. You will? Okay. So let's get the micros microscope back here. We'll get a slide ready for you and a toothpick. Now we're using a flat toothpick, not the pointed kind, and you don't have to scrape your cheek too hard to do this. And you've got to kind of open the inside of your mouth, scrape it around in there, and then smear that grody mess on the slide. We didn't get too much there. Try it again. Get a little bit more. Okay, looks like we got something there. Ooh, yes. <laughs> and we're gonna, let's put a drop of iodine on this slide now, just like we did on the plant cells. And then we'll get a cover slip, just like we did before. 
and we'll put it on this slide. And once again, put that on the stage of the microscope and let's see what it looks like. And let's look at that at 100 power and see what we get. Okay, can you see the, uh, the cells in there? Yeah, I can. And about what shape are they? A, probably like a circular shape. Kind of circular. Now let's switch up to 400 power and see what it looks like. Okay, Dennis, can you describe that cell to me? It's kind of triangular shape, but not all the way. Uh-huh. And uh, can you see the nucleus in there? Yes, I can. And what shape is that? It's circular. Okay. Let's let Lisa take a look here now. Lisa, can you describe what you see in there? It's like a yellow blotch. A yellow blotch, and can you see a little round thing inside the center? Yes. That's the nucleus, and that's what we're looking for. Now, how does that cell compare to the onion skin cell that we just looked at? Um, this one's more circular. Okay. The other one was stretched out. Kind of rectangular. Yeah. Okay. And do the nuclei look about the same? Yes. Okay, good. Now let's do one more experiment with cells, and this time let's take a look at plant cells and investigate the parts of the cell that make food from sunlight. And to do that, we're going to be using this plant. You can find it at any aquarium store. It's called Aladea or Anacris. And what we're going to do is pull off one little leaf and just look at the tip of the leaf under the microscope. Now, Lisa, I'd like you to take one plant out of there and pull off one little leaf for me. And, okay, you've got that leaf off. And uh, Dennis, I'd like you to take the slide and one of these cover slips and let's make a wet mount slide of that leaf tip. Go ahead and put that leaf on there. And put the cover slip on. Let's put a drop of water on it first, like that, and cover that up. And now let's let Lisa take a look at this cell or group of cells under the microscope and see what these Aladea leaf cells look like. I'll take that. And focus on that Aladea leaf plant. Is that in focus? Yes. Okay, what do those cells look like? Can you see them? Yeah, like a brick wall. It's like a brick wall? Yeah. Okay, like a lot of little, what, rectangles? Yeah. All right, can you see any um, little dots or anything inside? Yes. Those green dots are the chloroplasts, and they have chlorophyll in them, and that's why it's green. They make food from sunlight. All right, you want to take a look at that, Dennis? Sure. Do you agree with her? Yes. Can you see the chloroplasts in there? Yeah. Okay, now we're going to do a very interesting experiment. We're going to replace the fresh water on the slide with salt water and see what happens to the cell. Before we do this, though, we should switch up to the 400 power so we can get a better view of what we're looking at. So, Dennis, why don't you switch up to the 40x objective lens, and, and we will focus in on that and get a better view of what these individual cells look like. Now, what's it look like? A brick wall. It looks like a brick wall, huh? It still looks like it. So you're seeing the rectangular cells. Yeah. And then, are the little green dots more visible now? Yeah, there they are. Okay, you can see them. Are they kind of scattered throughout? Yeah. All right. Are they moving at all? No. Don't look to be moving. Okay. Now what I'm going to do is add a drop of salt water right on the edge of this cover slip here, and I'm going to draw it through onto the cells. And you tell me what happens to those little green things as we do this. Can you see any change? I see that they all have been pushed together. Okay. Tightly. Can you kind of see a membrane or kind of a covering around all those little green dots that's kind of brought them all together? Yeah. That's the cell membrane. And what, well, Lisa, you should probably take a look at this too. So let's pass this over to Lisa carefully. And you can tell me what you see in there. Do you see what we were just talking about there? Yes. You see them all clumped? Yeah. And it's different than it was when they were all spread out. Now, if we added fresh water back to that slide again and drew that salt water out just like we did before, so it switched it back. What do you think might happen? They would go back into a brick wall. Yeah. The, the little green dots would kind of spread back out again is what would happen. And that's what's going on here. All right, now we're going to do a real exciting experiment. I don't know who wants to do this, but we're going to 
pull that goldfish out of that little beaker we have there, and we're going to take a look at the tail of the goldfish on a slide at 100 power, and we're going to see if we can see the blood circulating in the tail. Now, supposedly, they say you can do this. Have you ever done this experiment before? No. How about nope. you? No? Okay. And who wants to capture the goldfish and kind of let it flop around in their hands? I do. You do? <laughs> okay. We're only going to allow the goldfish to be out of the water for four minutes. And Dennis, you have a watch. So you'll be our timer. Okay. Lisa, you will capture our goldfish. We'll get this slide off the stage. We'll get all ready to go here. We'll get a nice, fresh slide. We'll get some gauze that will wrap the goldfish in so it stays moist. And hopefully it won't flop around too much for Lisa while we look at its tail. So Lisa, why don't you go ahead and capture this goldfish. Okay, you got our goldfish for us. Now, okay, are you afraid of touching goldfish? No. Okay, see if you can get him out and we'll wrap him in this, we'll put him on this slide here and wrap him in this, uh, and I'll help you a little bit there. Oh, we got a goldfish there. Okay. I'm going to have to move him around a little bit here because we want to look at his tail. So we'll wrap him in this gauze. We, don't, we want to keep him moist here. And we'll put him on the slide. Hopefully his tail won't flop around too much. We'll put him on the slide so that his tail is exposed. And we'll look at him at 100 power on the microscope here. And looks like, Lisa, you're the closest here. You get to look at him. Are you starting our watch there, yeah. Dennis? Hi. And how's our time doing? Mm -hmm. One minute. Okay, one minute. Oh, we don't want these stage clips. They have to be out of the way. I'll get in the way of the goldfish. We're going to put that in the tail. Go ahead and focus on his tail now. Oh, no, I see. Tell me what you see. Like blood rushing through. Can you see the blood? Yes. Can you see like tiny little dots of blood corpuscles in there moving around? Yes. Good. Okay, what, let me move around just a little bit. Can you see the very end of the tail there? And you see tiny single, single little capillaries where the blood goes through? Yes. Good. Okay, well, let's let Dennis take a quick look here. Ooh, our goldfish is bouncing around. We should be able to adjust him here. Okay, Dennis, why don't you go ahead and take a look there. Can you see what we're talking about here? Is that in focus? Yeah. It's the blood going through these little lines. Okay, good. How's our time doing there, Dennis? We got about one more minute. Okay, good. Move it around a little bit further out the tail. Can you see like where the cell, where the veins get thinner and the, yeah. there's only like one or two bloods rolling through there? Yeah. Okay, good. All right, well, let's get our goldfish back in here now and save his life so he can live for another day. Oh, come on, boy. You can do it. Good. All right, now we're going to do one final experiment. In this last experiment, we're going to take a look at cells again. We're going to be looking at onion root tip cells, and this time it's a prepared slide where they've put special stains on the slide to allow us not only to see the nucleus, but to see the chromosomes, the parts of the nucleus, as they split, as the cell splits, and see the different stages of what they call different stages of mitosis, okay? So we're going to put this slide on here, and we have to get our stage clips back on. So go ahead and put that, those back on. And in this experiment, we're going to be looking at the slide at our highest power because this is very tiny and we need to see what we can. So let's start at 100 and then we'll move up to 400. So uh, Dennis, why don't you start out here and, and focus in on that slide. Move the slide around until you find the onion root tip there. You found it. You find the cells? Can you see the cells? Not quite. i got to focus it. Okay. Uh, there it is. Okay. Can you see inside the cells? I remember we were looking at nuclei yeah. before. What do you see now? Little tiny black dots. Dennis, why don't you move up to the 400 power now, and let's get a closer look at what's going on with these chromosomes. All right, and focus just a tiny bit so you bring your slide back into view. Okay, Dennis, you see the cells? Yeah. And you see inside the cells? Yeah. Now, do you see different stages of this splitting process going on in there? Yeah. Okay, now, can you describe one of them to me? Well, there's like a square and then it goes into a circle. A square goes into a circle, okay. And then it's a smaller circle and then there's little tiny dots everywhere. Okay, do you see anything that looks like a bunch of little snakes all wrapped up together? Yeah. Okay, that's a different stage. Do you see one that looks like a couple spiders like tarantulas on either side of the cell? 
Yeah, I can see that. You see that one? That's another phase. So really what we're doing is looking at all these different phases. And let's let Lisa take a look now, see if she, if she can describe some of these things here for us. Good. Can you find those cells now, Lisa? Yeah. All right, is it a brick wall again? Mm, not really. It's yeah. like a tire track. Like tire track. So track. that's good. And uh, do you see all the different uh, shapes of the chromosomes in there? Some are different than others inside the rectangles. Yes. Well, let me explain what's happening here. First, before mitosis takes place, the cell's in a phase called interphase. Then we have prophase, where the chromosomes become visible. This progresses into metaphase, where the chromosomes become arranged in the center of the cell. Then this progresses into anaphase, as the pairs of chromosomes split and they're drawn to the opposite ends of the cell. That's where we get our little spider picture here. Finally, the last phase is called telophase, where the chromosomes become diffuse once again and the nuclear envelope reforms. If you look closely, you might even see where the new cell wall is forming to make two new cells. Then this process starts all over again. To learn these phases of mitosis, remember the saying PMAT for prophase, metaphase, anaphase, and telophase. And that's uh, one good reason for looking at this slide because the cells are such and the stain is such, it allows us to see the chromosomes. That's kind of neat, huh? Mm -hmm. And there's all those different stages. Okay, that pretty much concludes this section on cells. Did you guys enjoy this? Yeah. Yeah. Did you learn anything? Yeah. I know these guys have never done these experiments before, believe me. You haven't, have you? Okay, no. and you, we've looked at plant cells, we've looked at animal cells, we looked at the yellow deal leaves and we added the salt water, remember, and all the little green things came together. We saw the cell membrane, we saw what salt water did to the cell, and you did a great job with that goldfish. And then finally we looked at the chromosomes as they split. Now we're going to go on to the next section, and we just started with prepared slides. We're going to look at some more prepared slides in part three. In this segment, we're going to be looking at permanent slides, and I've chosen eight particularly interesting things to look at. They are the cross-section of a pine needle, the cross-section of different plant stems, the cross-section of different plant leaves, an earthworm cross-section, a complete flea, some different types of insect legs, blood cells, and bacteria. Now, when I refer to the word cross-section, it means just that, a very thin section cut through the specimen. But let me give you an example here. Let's take this plant stem and these scissors and cut off a piece of the stem. Now, if we push the stem just a little bit through the scissors and cut off a tiny little thin piece, if you can see this or not, that little piece would have been a cross-section. Now, scientists don't use scissors to make these cross-sections, but rather they use a very expensive instrument that cuts the sections so thin that they're transparent. Think about what some of the shapes would be. The shape of this plant stem would be circular. What would the shape of an earthworm cross-section be? Well, we'll be finding that out shortly. But let's start now by taking a look at pine needles. Now, I've looked at lots of slides in my life, and they're always interesting. But every now and then, you find some that are really amazing. And this cross-section of a pine needle is one of those slides. Without looking at this, most people can't comprehend all the stuff that's inside of a single pine needle. And the next time you walk by a pine tree, check out the needles. They usually grow in bundles of up to eight needles per bundle. Break a pine needle in half, and try to visualize its cross-sectional shape. Then take your prepared slide and place it on the stage of your microscope and check out what a very thin section of pine needle looks like. Use your lowest power first, then move up to 100 or even 400 power for greater detail. First notice that the outside covering, or epidermis, is composed of a thick, hard covering. This is important to allow the pine to survive through long periods of low rainfall or cold winters. Now look along the outer edge for tiny openings. These are called stomata, and they're special cells that open and close to let gases in and out of the needle. Think of them as breathing holes, and remember this word, stomata. Here's one that's closed. 
The next layer of cells contains chlorophyll and allows the needle to produce food or sugar from sunlight. These cells don't look green because this specimen was stained. Also in this area, you'll notice these round circular tubes. These are resin ducts, and the resin is used to seal up an injury if it occurs. In the center of the needle, you'll see one or two bundles of veins. This needle has two, and in these veins, there are two types of tubes. Some tubes carry water from the roots. These are called the xylem. Other tubes, usually smaller, carry food around to the rest of the tree. These food veins are called phloem. These are both two important words to know, and here's how I remember them. First, remember the saying, food flows. So the phloem tubes are the food tubes. And then W and X are right next to each other in the alphabet. So the X word, xylem, are the water tubes. Got that? So now when you check out your slide of a pine needle, look for all those parts. And I'll bet that pine needles will never look the same to you again. Let's move on now to our next observation, plant stems. Before we begin this investigation, there are some important differences that you should be aware of. First, in the flowering plants, there are two main classes, the monocots and the dicots. They get these names by the types of seeds they have. If it's a one-part seed, like corn, the plant is a monocot. And if it's a two-part seed, like a uh, lima bean, then it's a dicot. But there's another interesting characteristic of these plants. The leaves of a monocot have straight parallel veins, and the veins in a dicot are branched or netted. So you should now be able to tell the difference between a monocot and a dicot just by looking at their leaves. When we investigate the cross-section of their stems, we can also see some differences. And it lies mainly in the arrangement of the phloem and the xylem, remember the food and the water tubes. In this monocot, a corn stem, the bundles of veins are scattered throughout. And in a dicot, like this sunflower stem, the xylem and phloem bundles are found in a ring. So now, when you look at your slides, you should be able to tell the difference. And here's a good way to remember it. In this container, I have a sample of corn. And you know that corn is a one-part seed and that the leaves of corn have straight parallel veins. It's a monocot. Then if you can remember the saying, scattering corn, then you'll also remember that the veins in a monocot are scattered throughout the stem. And by default, the other one, with the veins in a ring, must be the dicot. Now I especially like the slide of this corn stem because the veins look like little faces. The large circles with the thick walls are xylem or water veins. This one large circle without a wall was xylem at one time, but became stretched and destroyed as the plant grew. It's now just an airspace. The phloem, or food veins, are located in this upper area, and on close inspection, you'll see they're composed of smaller companion cells, too. Also notice that the whole bundle is enclosed in a sheath of protective cells. Looking at the dicot stem, you'll find the food or phloem tubes are on the outside and smaller than the xylem tubes. These plant stems usually have a bundle cap of protective cells, too. Now, some plants have a hard, woody surface, and in others, the stem is soft, non-woody, or herbaceous. Monocots generally have a soft, herbaceous stem, and dicots can either be herbaceous or woody. There's much to see when you observe the cross-section of a woody stem. The central cells make up the pith. Then we come to an area where the first xylem cells were made, but only when the plant was very young. Now, in this plant, all new xylem and phloem cells are made here in a special region called the cambium. As the plant grows, Material on the inside of this cambium become new xylem cells, and material on the outside of the line become new phloem cells. As the xylem cells are formed, they push the cambium line and the phloem outward. And with all this pressure, something's got to give. The epidermis ruptures, 
and the cells in this area, called the cortex, get squished and distorted. To protect the outside surface, special cork cells are produced, and when they die, they become bark. You can tell the age of your woody stem by counting the xylem rings. In the spring, there's lots of water, and the xylem cells are large. In the summer, though, when there's less water, the xylem cells are much smaller. So an annual ring is really just a change in the size of xylem cells produced at the cambium. This stem is one year old. This one is one, two years old. And this one is, let's see, one, two, three years old. Incidentally, as the plant grows, the cells in the inner wood die and serve only for support. Only the outer layers of xylem remain functional. So now, hopefully, you should be able to look at any plant cross-section and be able to tell, one, whether it's a monocot or a dicot, and two, whether it's herbaceous or woody. Good luck with your observations. Now let's go on to our observation number three, plant leaves. Like the pine needle leaf, the leaves of flowering plants are also pretty amazing. Remember, it's in the leaf where most of the photosynthesis takes place. So the leaves are like tiny little sugar factories. Let's take a look at some cross sections. When you first look at your slide, try and determine which side of the leaf is the top. Generally, if your leaf has long column-shaped cells on one side, that's the top. On the very surface called the cuticle, you may see a waxy substance called cutin. This is secreted by the epidermal cells and helps the leaf to retain water. The cuticle and epidermis cells are transparent. This allows light to shine through onto the next layer of cells, the palisade cells. These are the cells with the chlorophyll, and it's here that most of the photosynthesis takes place. Below the palisade layer are the spongy cells. They're irregular in shape, and they often have large air spaces between them. Usually on the bottom of the leaf, you'll find the breathing holes, or stomata. Look closely at one, and you should be able to see the special cells that open and close. These cells are called guard cells. By looking at a cross-section, you might also be able to determine if your leaf is a monocot or a dicot. Remember, the leaf veins are parallel in a monocot and branched or netted in a dicot. So in a monocot, you might expect to see a line of equally sized veins. And in a dicot, you might expect to see one big central vein and some smaller veins out along the sides. Corn, remember, is a monocot. Notice the veins along the leaf. Notice also that the middle of the leaf is much thicker than the edges. This leaf is obviously a dicot with a large central vein and smaller veins further out. Plants also have adaptations to their environment, usually depending on how wet it is. A hydrophyte, or plant that lives in water, may have large air pockets in its leaf. These help it to float. The hydrophyte will also have the stomata located on the top of the leaf only. Can you guess why? Plants that live in a very dry environment are called xerophytes. Their leaves will generally have a thick epidermis to help the leaf retain water. This plant has an epidermis that's three to four cells thick. Also, in a xerophyte, you'll usually find many stomata on the bottom side of the leaf. Notice how numerous they are. And remember that elodea leaf that we looked at in the last section? Well, here's a cross section of one of those leaves. Take a look at what it looks like. This should illustrate why we can place a whole leaf on a slide and see the individual cells. Now let's move on to animals and take a look at the cross section of an earthworm. Before we take a look at this earthworm slide, let me first talk a little bit about muscles. An earthworm has two different types of muscles. It has circular muscles that go around its body like this. And it has longitudinal muscles that run the length of its body. Now, imagine that if you were an earthworm, what would happen when these circular muscles contracted or got smaller? What would happen to your body? Well, it should get thinner and longer, right? 
And what would happen if the longitudinal muscles got shorter or contracted? What would happen to your body then? Well, in this case, it should get shorter and wider. Now, an earthworm uses these two sets of muscles alternately to help it to move. And if you get a chance to watch an earthworm move, notice how these muscular contractions move down the length of the worm. When you look at your slide, you should be able to see these two sets of muscles. The circular muscles are found just under the epidermis. Further in, we'll see the longitudinal muscles. The main interior organ of an earthworm is its intestine. It runs throughout most of the body. Inside the intestine is a big fold called a typhlosol. This fold gives the intestine more surface area. The typhlosol connects at the top of the intestine, so this part is the top or dorsal side of the worm. The bottom is called the ventral side, and you can easily remember which is which by remembering the alphabetical order. D is at the top, V is at the bottom. Now, don't confuse these words with anterior or front of the worm and posterior or tail. Looking at the slide again, you should be able to find the dorsal blood vessel. And you might also find the smaller ventral blood vessel and the ventral nerve cord. If your cross section was made at just the right place, you might see one of the bristles or seta. These bristles have their own muscles and can be completely withdrawn into the body. This organ is called a nephridium. They're found on either side, and it's like a kidney. Incidentally, this cavity isn't empty, but it's filled with fluid that helps give the worm its shape. Well, that about covers this slide, but there's much more to learn about worms. They're pretty interesting little critters. A flea, as you probably already know, is a very small wingless insect that lives off the blood of mammals and birds. And like a butterfly, a flea goes through a complete metamorphosis, from egg to larva to pupa to adult. This is the larval stage of the flea, and it's about two millimeters long. It eventually spins a cocoon about itself and becomes a pupa, and finally emerges from the cocoon as an adult flea. Sometimes, though, the adult fleas will stay in their cocoons in kind of a quiescent or hibernating state. And when there's a disturbance, they all emerge from their cocoons at once. This is exactly what happened to me when I visited a vacant house once. It was a flea banquet at my expense. When you look at your slide of the adult flea, you might first check out its sex. The female has a rounded abdomen with no external parts. The male, on the other hand, has an abdomen that's tilted upward and two claspers that are used in holding the female. Also on the back end of both the male and female is a pitted area covered with little bristles. It's called a pygidium, or sensilium, and it's a sense organ. It helps the flea to escape danger. By focusing in and out, you should be able to count the number of pits in this area. Fleas have very well-developed legs, particularly the upper segment. You should also check out the claws at the tip of the legs. The body of the flea is actually quite thin and compressed and composed of many plates. Growing from these plates are backward projecting bristles or spines. Some fleas have thick, heavy spines arranged in rows. These are called combs, and this flea has two, a pronotal comb behind the head, and a genal comb just below the head. These combs help scientists to identify the genus and species of a particular flea. The antenna of the flea is hidden and folded back in a special groove behind its eye. The mouth parts are of the sucking type, and you might be able to see the three piercing stylets if you carefully focus in and out. Unlike the mosquito, both the male and female flea drink blood. Once again, we have a pretty amazing specimen here, that of an insect that's very well adapted to its environment. Speaking of adaptations, let's now investigate insect legs and observe their differences. 
you may already have investigated bee legs and discovered some of their fascinating adaptations, like a special basket on the rear legs used to carry pollen, or unique brushes on the front legs that the bee uses to clean its antenna. Often, an expert can identify an insect just by looking at its legs. A housefly has long, sleek legs covered with hair-like bristles. At the end of the leg, you'll find a pair of tarsal claws and some hairy pads called pulvilli. These claws and pads help the fly to cling to walls, ceilings, and even to smooth surfaces like glass. An insect that lives in the water and swims a lot might have legs like this. It uses these wide, hairy legs as paddles or oars. Imagine how ineffective a thin leg would be in the water. Some insects, like the praying mantis, have grasping legs. And with your microscope, you'll see many sharp projections along the length of the leg. These projections help this insect to catch and hold prey. Now, let's look at this leg and make some inferences. It's not a grasping leg nor a swimming leg, and it doesn't have clinging pads. But it is sleek and well-developed, so it looks like it might be the leg of a running insect. Finally, if you want to be super scientific and name the leg parts, they are from the top, the coxa, where the leg connects to the body, then a small structure called a trochanter, followed by the femur, the tibia, and the tarsus, which consists of a number of tarsal segments. Remember, the clinging leg has the pads, the swimming leg is wide and hairy, the grasping leg has the sharp projections, and the running leg is probably long and sleek with a couple of tarsal claws. When you look at your specimens, you may not get these particular legs, and in fact, you might find a leg that's adapted for a different purpose. What do you think a digging leg might look like? Well, good luck with your observations. We're now going to go on to our next slide, blood. I read somewhere that the shape of a red blood cell is like a donut without a hole. And to better comprehend that, I made one for you. It's like a disc that's squashed in the middle. And in fact, the red blood cells are sometimes called discocytes. But a more common word for the red cells is urethrocytes. And as you can see, even at the highest power, they're quite small. Here's some other things to look for. White cells, or leukocytes. They have nuclei, and the stain should make them quite visible. Look closely at a few of them and compare the shape of their nuclei. Now, with some luck, a good eye, and a properly stained slide, you may find some platelets. They gather in small clumps and are very important in helping your blood to clot. And if you have a chance, compare these cells to stained blood specimens of other animals. Now, on to the final slide in our series, bacteria. This bacteria slide was included so that you can get a feeling about how small bacteria really are. Also from this slide, you should be able to identify the three types. So when you see some live bacteria, at least you'll be able to identify its type. They are the coccus, or spear shape, and they're very small. The second type is the bacillus, or rod shape. And the third type is the spirellum, or spiral shape. Remember, there's thousands of different types of bacteria in this world but they can generally be classified into one of these three categories. Well, that about wraps up this section on prepared slides. And if you thought these samples were interesting, wait till you see this next section on life in pond water. For our next and final segment, we'll take a look at living things found in pond water. And it's really very fascinating. But we won't just collect the pond water and take a look at it. Rather, we will culture the sample first. To do this, we'll take a sample of our pond water and pour it into a larger container of water that's loaded with food. In effect, we're upsetting the balance of nature in a small container. 
Living things in your pond water will find this food, eat it, and reproduce rapidly. And within a few days, you'll have many more organisms to look at. So before you collect your pond water, you should first make some of these special culturing solutions. And to do that, we'll go to the kitchen. Now there's a number of different types of culture media we can make. I'll show you two of them and tell you how to make a few others. In this first one, we're going to take one liter of water, a little more than a quart, and this is spring water. I bought it at the grocery store. I'm going to take this water and put it in a pan. Then I'm going to boil this water on the stove. Now to save some time, I won't actually do this. But once the water comes to boil, as soon as it comes to boil, you turn the flame down and you take some hay. Now this is Timothy hay, but any kind of hay will work as long as it's brown. We'll take a handful of hay, about this much, and we'll throw it, not throw it, but place it into the boiling water. And we'll boil it for 10 minutes. This boiling process will break down the hay and make the perfect food for the bacteria to live off. You're going to let this cool. Remember, you're working with heat here, and you want to be safe. Once it's cool, you take this mixture, hay and all, and pour it back into your container. And you let this sit for two to three days. You will then have a container with hay, which is food for bacteria, and lots of bacteria. Lots of food, but it's food for the protozoans. Once this is made, you're ready to go out and collect your pond water. Pour about 30 milliliters or four tablespoons into the container. Now, if you want to break this up into four smaller containers, that's OK, too. But you'll pour less pond water into each. Store your container in a cool, shady place for three to 10 days. You'll check it each day and see what you can find. After about 10 days, you should definitely see protozoan zipping around in here. Now, if the liquid turns milky, you got a problem. It's got too much bacteria in it, and you need to dilute it with more spring water. This hay infusion works quite well, but there are other mixtures you might try, too, if you really want to experiment. One I've been quite successful with is made out of egg yolk. If you want to try this, you start by hard boiling an egg. Then you take just a pinch of the yolk, and you put it in a small bowl with some water. Then you crush it up and make a paste out of it with a spoon. Then you go ahead and take your liter of boiled water, let it cool, pour it in the container, and then pour in the egg yolk paste. Now stir all that up, and after two days, pour in your pond water. Use the same amount, about 30 milliliters. Now there's a lot of possibilities here for a science project. You could see what type of culture medium produce what type of protozoans. You could always use the same pond water each time. You might try things like powdered milk, and in this case, just use a pinch of powdered milk, just like we did with the egg yolk. Or you might try five grains of uncooked rice or a few grains of wheat. These all make good culture media. Now let's go to the pond and see how to collect water samples. Most of the organisms we'll be looking at are from a tenth to a half a millimeter long and are commonly found in fresh water. But don't think they're only found in ponds, as just about any freshwater source will work. Look in lakes, streams, or even an old rain puddle. Take a couple of jars with you, too, when you collect your samples, and collect samples from both the surface and the bottom. You can use a basting tool to collect bottom samples. If you're a young scientist, it's a good idea to have an adult along with you to help. When you collect your water samples, Throw in a small amount of bottom mud and any material you might find floating on the surface. Label each sample jar with a number and record the date, time, and place where each sample was collected. It's also a good practice to wash your hands each time you touch your sample water. Keep your sample culture jars in the shade and uncapped and check them daily. Every couple of days, Observe some sample drops with your microscope. You can collect a surface sample with an eyedropper and a bottom sample with a long pipette or straw. To do this, place your thumb over the end of the straw, stick it all the way down into the culture solution, then release your thumb and replace it again, and carefully transport this sample to a smaller container. The first water to come from the straw is a bottom sample. 
use your low-power lenses and a well slide to observe it. If you find something good, either transfer it to a wet mount slide or prepare a new slide. If the organisms are moving fast, you may wish to add a bit of cotton from a cotton ball to your sample. This protozoan is trapped between cotton threads for easy observation. Some of the things you might find are tiny animals, like these rotifers. Notice that they have spinning cilia at one end of their body. This tiny living thing is called a hydra, and it's really quite big, even bigger than an ant. It looks like a small plant, but it's really an animal, and it's related to the jellyfish. These are the tentacles of the hydra. You might also find some tiny worms, or another tiny animal called a daphnia. The daphnia is also called a water flea, and it has a transparent body. You can even see its heart beating if you look closely. To keep the daphnia from spinning around, soak up some of the water in your well slide with a bit of paper towel. The daphnia is much smaller than the hydra and is actually food for the hydra. You may even be lucky and see this food chain in action. This hydra is capturing the daphnia with its tentacles and eating it whole with its mouth, which is found at the base of the tentacles. Related to the daphnia is this animal, the cyclops, and this tiny bivalved animal called an ostracod. These are crustaceans and are also related to shrimp and lobster. With your microscope, you may also see some tiny things that are even smaller than a daphnia and look like plants or animals. Well, they're not really plants or animals, but are in a special group of their own called protists. Now, when people arrange things, they organize them into groups with similar characteristics, like clothes in a closet, silverware in a drawer, or even tools on a workbench. Protists are also arranged by their characteristics. Some resemble plants more than animals. These protists are called algae. Like plants, most have chlorophyll and make food from sunlight, and most are made of only a single cell, although some cells can live together. The algae are further arranged according to their color. Other protists are more animal-like. These we call protozoans. We further classify them not by color, but by how they move. The amoeba is in a group called the sarcodina, and it moves with a pseudopod, or false foot. This pseudopod flows outward like a blob of jelly. Then the rest of the body catches up with it. There are many types of amoebas, but all are made of only one cell. To find them, look in the bottom or the sides of your sample jar. The second group is called the ciliophora, and these are the protozoans that move with cilia, or tiny hair-like oars. The paramecium is a good example, as its entire body is covered with cilia. And like the amoebas, there are many types of ciliophora. This one's called an oxytrica. This tulip-shaped one on a springy stalk is called a vorticella. This pink one is called a blepharisma, and this green trumpet-shaped one is called a stentor. These protozoans are also made of only one single cell. The third group is called the mastigophora, and they move with a special whip-like extension called a flagellum. This is a paranema, and it rotates the tip of its flagellum to propel itself through the water. The euglena moves its flagellum back and forth to move itself through the water. Now this one's hard to classify because it also has chlorophyll and can make food from sunlight. The volvox is really a colony of many single-celled flagellates all connected together by fine threads. Each cell has two flagella and like the euglena, it has chlorophyll too. The final group is called the sporozoans and they're all parasites and they usually don't move. Plasmodium is a sporozoan which causes malaria. Protozoans reproduce by a process called fission. Now remember the onion root tip cells where we saw the chromosomes and the nucleus splitting? Well, this same process of mitosis happens inside a protozoan. After the nucleus becomes two, the protozoan itself splits in the middle and makes two new daughter cells. 
Fission in this paramecium lasts about 15 minutes, and finally the two new cells go their own way. Unless you're lucky, you'll have to spend some time with your microscope and your water samples to see this fission process. The food chain on the microscopic level is also very interesting. When you added the hay or the egg yolk to your sample jar, you're setting up a food supply for bacteria, which in turn become food for many protozoans. Now bacteria are very different from plants, animals, and protists, so scientists put them in their own kingdom, the kingdom Monera. They're further classified not by their color or by how they move, but rather by their shape. And there's three types. Take a look at your prepared slide of the bacteria with a good quality microscope at around 400 power. You should be able to see the three types. They are the straight rod, the spiral rod, and the sphere. Most bacteria are so very tiny, they might just look like wiggling little dots. But you might look out and culture some larger varieties. These protozoans, called oxytrica, are consumers as they feed on this swarm of bacteria. Other protozoans, like the paranema, are scavengers. They choose to eat dead material. And here you see a bunch of them inside the body of a dead rotifer. Amoebas aren't too particular about what they eat. Usually, whatever they can catch with a pseudopod. They capture and enclose the food with this false foot. Then they develop a food vacuole or bubble around it. Then they slowly absorb this food into their cell. Look closely at your specimens, and you might see something wiggling around inside a food vacuole. One of the most awesome predator-prey relationships is that of the didinium and the paramecium. The didinium is a cute little barrel-shaped protozoan that moves with cilia. It's very picky about what it eats, as it lives entirely on paramecium. It catches them with a hook and fishing line type apparatus, and the hook has a toxin on it that paralyzes the paramecium. In the next few minutes, the didinium literally devours the paramecium whole by expanding its mouth and drawing the prey into its body. Imagine if you had to eat something that was bigger than yourself, and you had to do it all in just two minutes. What's left is a round, fat didinium digesting its meal. You know, most people are totally unaware of all the things that go on in just a single drop of water. And scientists estimate there are over 50,000 different species of protozoans. So if you spend some time with your samples, you're bound to see some interesting things. You may even choose to do a science project on protozoans. These two students are studying how paramecium react to different voltages. They created a test chamber with a well slide and two wires. The wire tips were five millimeters away. They added five drops of paramecium sample to the well and connected batteries of different voltages to the wires to see what the paramecium would do. At three volts, they noticed that the paramecium moved toward the minus electrode. At four and a half volts, it was even more noticeable. Then they looked at the sample with a high power microscope. They could see the paramecia spinning around in a counterclockwise direction. You could try this experiment yourself to see if your results agree with theirs. As we bring this program to a close, I'm sure you'll agree with me that there's lots of information on this video. And I hope you go back and review particular segments and learn as much science as you can. I should also let you in on a little secret. When I started making this program, I didn't know all these things, and I learned a lot of science just by making this video. So get your own microscope if you can, and do some of your own observations and some of your own experiments. I'm sure you'll find out that there's a lot more out there yet to see. And I'll see you on the next one. Bye for now.